Hello everyone, welcome back. And today I'm going to run you through what was essentially my first real research project as a post-bachelor researcher. So this was something that I completed earlier in this year, or late last year either way, and I flew out and presented it at the Anxiety and Depression Association of America conference back in March in Denver, Colorado, I believe, yeah. And this was something that I think was really cool, and I just wanted to share with you all what it is and what it was kind of like to be involved in the research process as a new researcher. So I had been involved in one major research project prior to this where I was responsible for designing a study, but that study launched like the month that COVID happened in 2020. So what ended up happening is that project kind of got handed over to someone else, even though I was the one who started and helmed the project, uh, someone else who was of a higher you know, qualification was going to essentially finish that project. I didn't get to analyze the data at the end. So later on, after kind of COVID had settled down a little bit, I approached my mentor and I said, you know, I'd love to really be able to analyze some data and do my own research project for my own hypothesis. And he said, great, we've got this recent data set that we just kind of acquired. Uh, there's a lot of data here. Maybe you could form a hypothesis and run some data on it or run some tests on it. And I said, great. And that's what we ended up doing. So today I'm going to run you through what my first research project was, what that was like, and uh, what we kind of found through that project. Let's get into it. So the data set that had recently been acquired by my mentor and his lab was for a larger study that was examining a lot of different things. Uh, I think they used 10 or so different measurements. And when you're running a study that big, you kind of start with a question in mind and you collect all this data, but you're not always going to be thinking about how each of the individual variables can relate to other variables. And there's lots of different ways that you could examine the relationship between variables that are collected in those larger scale studies. So I was essentially given the opportunity to, to say, okay, this is the question that we attempted to answer. Looking at these you know, measurements that we have, the data that we gathered, is there a hypothesis that you can form from the measurements that we have that you could eventually test? Now, I didn't get to look at the data beforehand because that's a bad practice in science. So you don't get to say, okay, I've looked at the numbers now, let me form a hypothesis. It was more so, okay, these are the measurements that we have. Would you like to form a hypothesis before you get a chance to analyze that data? And then you can analyze the data and see if there's any relationship that you might think. So I said, great, that's, uh, that's exactly what I'd like to do. So I ended up getting to look at the Beck Depression Inventory 2, which is a very widely known scale of depression. It's used to measure depression in individuals. All of the measurements that I got to work with were self-reports. So it's important to remember that none of these were like clinically diagnosed measures of anything. It was more so self-reports that individuals took. Another one that I looked at was an impulsive behavior scale that measured what is called negative urgency and positive urgency. So negative Urgency is impulsivity when you're in a bad mood. So let's say you're having a bad day, you're more likely to act impulsively if you have high negative urgency. Positive urgency is if you're going to be impulsive when you're in a positive mood. So let's say you're having a good day, you might result to acting impulsively in a way that you normally wouldn't if you were in a bad or normal mood. And a person can have both high and low or high positive urgency and negative urgency. They can have a mix of the two. You get the point there. So the final thing that we looked at was going to be anhedonia. And anhedonia is kind of a lack of feeling towards things that you would normally feel pleasure towards. So if you are feeling anhedonia, you might not feel pleasure engaging in your favorite activity, for example. And this is a common feeling that we see with people who have various, um, you know, psychopathologies, these sorts of things. So specifically within anhedonia, we looked at what's called consumatory anhedonia, which is a lack of pleasure when engaging in a activity directly. And then we looked at anticipatory anhedonia, which is the lack of pleasure when you are anticipating acting in an activity. So someone with high anticipatory anhedonia is unlikely to feel excited about something coming up that would usually be exciting to them. Let's say you've got an event coming up next week, and normally that would be exciting to you. If you're experiencing anticipatory anhedonia, you're not going to be excited about that. Whereas if you're experiencing consumatory anhedonia, then you're not going to be excited about actually engaging in that process directly. And again, just like with the last variable, there can be a mix in how you uh, score in these individual variables. You could have high in one, high in both, low in one, low in both, and so on. So those are the primary variables that I uh, looked into when I was forming my hypothesis. Those are the ones that stood out to me. The type of analysis that 
I ended up deciding to perform on this data is known as moderation analysis. So in moderation analysis, you're attempting to see how the relationship between two variables is impacted by a third variable. So let's say we have hours spent exercising and we want to know how that affects resting heart rate. You might say, okay, there's probably a relationship between your hours spent exercising and your resting heart rate. But a moderator variable is something that's going to impact that relationship. So say, for example, using this example, we could think of age. So while your hour spent exercising might impact your resting heart rate, your age could also be a middle factor that influences the relationship between those two variables. So with that in mind, with my study, we wanted to test to see if anhedonia could act as this moderator variable of the association between depression and impulsivity. So essentially we said, okay, we have depression. We want to know if depression is going to impact impulsivity in individuals. And we want to see if an individual's score on anhedonia, whether or not they're experiencing anhedonia is going to impact the relationship between their depression and their impulsivity. So that is the analysis that we decided to run. The final two hypotheses that we ended up running analysis on involved the relationship between depression and negative impulsivity and then using anhedonia as the moderator as opposed to depression and positive impulsivity. So the reason we chose negative impulsivity over positive impulsivity is because we didn't really think there was going to be a relationship between depression and then how somebody acts when they're in a good mood. So we were more interested in the negative mood state associated with depression. So therefore we tested the relationship between depression and negative urgency using both anticipatory and consumatory anhedonia as two different moderating variables to test and see if there was going to be a relationship between depression and negative urgency using those two variables. So what did we find? What did the analysis tend to support in terms of our hypotheses? Well, we found that depression was associated with negative urgency, which is something that we uh, hypothesized, but we also found that depression and its interaction with consumatory anhedonia, which is the type of anhedonia involving pleasure in experiences right now as you're experiencing them, the interaction between depression and consumatory anhedonia did have an impact on negative urgency or negative impulsivity as well. Uh, there was no relationship between depression, anticipatory anhedonia, and impulsivity. So the only statistical relationships that we found involved depression, consumatory anhedonia, and negative urgency. There was also no relationship between consumatory anhedonia on its own in relation to impulsivity. So to kind of summarize this to someone who may not be, you know, more research oriented, this essentially means that, you know, if you are experiencing depression, there's also probably going to be a relationship between that depression and you acting impulsively while in a negative mood state, but also that anhedonia, especially anhedonia in the moment when you're experiencing something is going to impact this. Now, there's a very specific way that it impacts this when we're talking about how we analyze the data. So essentially, as you can see, kind of by the, the key note of my my poster here is that depression is associated with negative mood impulsivity only when consumatory and hedonia is low. And the way that you can think about that is that if you're experiencing anhedonia, which is again, the lack of feeling towards something, specifically in this case, consumatory anhedonia, if you're experiencing that anhedonia and you're also someone who's experiencing depressive-like symptoms, then you're actually less likely to act impulsively despite your depression. And this means that as consumatory anhedonia rises, meaning as you feel less and less pleasure towards experiences, even if you are experiencing depression, then you're less likely to be impulsive in a negative mood state. Now, when you kind of think about it, this really does make sense from a more heuristic standpoint. It's kind of like saying, well, even though I'm depressed, I'm also feeling kind of gray and no enjoyment out of things. So then why would I feel impulsive if I'm also not feeling any joy towards things? And that's really what we wanted to test and kind of see if this was true with this analysis. And that's what the data tends to support. Now, it is important to remember limitations with a study like this. So with a study like this, we're also only using self-reports. And this was also taken, uh, the sample was essentially undergraduate 
college students. So around the age of like 18 to 26, for example, is the age group that this study was really kind of normed on. So it's really maybe not representative of an entire population or entire of humanity. And you have to think about it in the terms of limitations there. My favorite part about the study, though, was getting to kind of think about what these results mean afterwards. Essentially, now that we know that there is a relationship or we can essentially see that there is at least evidence that supports the idea that there is a relationship between depression and negative impulsivity when you have consumatory anhedonia as a moderator, what can we theorize about the results of that? It's important to remember as you get into the discussion section of a paper or a poster or any sort of study that you're kind of just theorizing. Like you are theorizing with the support of data, but you're not saying for certain this is what will happen uh, unless you have really, really strong evidence to support that idea. But instead you're saying, okay, this is what someone could think about using this data as evidence or a guide to support their thinking. And what we were thinking about, or what I specifically was thinking about as this study kind of came to a close and as we analyzed the data and got our results, was that if you're going to be treating someone who maybe has clinical depression or is experiencing depressive-like symptoms, then it might be noteworthy to pay attention to whether or not they are experiencing anhedonia. And then if you treat that anhedonia by itself, so let's say you're experiencing someone who has both high depression and high anhedonia, meaning they're very depressed, but they're also like not feeling very much pleasure towards the things that they're uh, trying to interact with alongside the regular depressive symptoms. If you lower the anhedonia by itself without also lowering the original depressive symptoms, then you might see a rise in impulsivity in negative mood states alongside that. So essentially, if you're depressed and you also feel nothing, but then you start to maybe get that feeling back, but then you're still depressed, now you might also kind of go towards the negative mood impulsivity because you're feeling some sort of emotion, some sort of maybe even excitement or thrill about things again, and that might cause you to act impulsively when you do get into negative mood states. So that was the kind of final discussion section of the poster. And to me, that was the most exciting because I think that's what I really enjoy with research is getting to think about how the data is going to impact the world after essentially saying, okay, this is what we... This is what we analyzed. This is what we saw. Now, what does it mean for the world as opposed to just saying, here are our findings? So that was really my first research poster in kind of a more simplified terms, you know, not really talking about the statistics too, too much. Um, now I kind of want to go over maybe a little bit about the experience as a whole as someone who was a post-bachelor student and experienced research, travel, these sorts of things as a volunteer. When it comes to research, I was in a weird position compared to most other researchers in that not only was I a volunteer researcher, but as I was completing this particular analysis, I was a distance volunteer. So my previous mentor actually switched schools. So while I was working in his lab originally, I technically was not working in his lab at the time that this analysis was produced. And what this means is that I unfortunately got no compensation for my time or the travel that I had to do to present this poster. And that is something that might be uh, something you need to think about if you're a recent post-bachelor student and you wanna get involved in volunteer research is that sometimes volunteer research isn't going to afford you the opportunities to afford quite literally the things that you need to do to present these posters. I had to pay you know, somewhere around a thousand to two thousand dollars in that range to fly halfway across the country, book a hotel for three nights, lie back just so I could spend, you know, a few hours in the conference hall to present this poster. Other than that, though, other than the financial struggles associated with the travel near the end of the poster, this entire process was something that I really enjoyed. And I think if you're a upcoming, you know, psychology student who's interested in research, see if you can get involved in a research lab and then, you know, start thinking about ideas about uh, studies that you could perform or even data that you could analyze what I didn't realize as a new researcher is that you can perform data analysis on studies that have already been completed as long as you're not going to look at the data and then form your hypothesis. You don't want to say, OK, you know, these are the numbers. Now let me try and form a hypothesis just so I can be right in what I'm assuming. Another thing that's also important to remember is that it's OK to have non-significant relationships. So if you're studying the interaction between two or three variables, it's just as important to recognize that there is not a relationship between variables as there is to say there is a relationship. 
And that's going to be something that you're going to see in modern psychology research is everyone's obsessed with significant research. They want to say, okay, I found a relationship between these two things. And in my mind, it's just as important to be able to say, okay, I looked into this to see if there was a relationship and there was none. And you might see researchers be afraid to present those findings, you know, at a poster or conference or something. And you can even see this in my own poster where we didn't really talk much about anticipatory anhedonia in the results and the findings, even though we found that there was no significant relationship between uh, depression and negative urgency using anticipatory anhedonia as that moderating variable. We mention it in the analysis section, but it doesn't really get to take up much of that center stage. And I think it's important for researchers and psychology students as a whole to recognize that non-statistically significant results are also important to research. But overall, I really enjoyed this you know, research experience, and I hope you got to enjoy seeing what it was like being involved in research as a kind of fledgling researcher over the past few years. And maybe this will motivate you if you're someone to get involved with a lab at your university, whether you're in psychology or not, a lot of areas are going to have research that are very similar. But um, it was experience and I joined and I'm really grateful to have the mentors who helped and guided me through this process. And I think that's another thing that's important is if you are uh, a younger researcher, look for mentors and look for ones who are going to help you, even if they're not maybe going to get a lot in return, other than maybe a few publications with you as a, uh, a co-author. So thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed getting a look into what it was like performing kind of official psychology research as a recent post-bachelor student. Have a good one.